Are we facing anything new in the grand design, as far as you know, than uh, what we faced in his uh, previous book, A Brief History of Time? There's nothing new scientifically in this book, nothing new about the origin of the universe or about the fine-tuning of the universe. Mm-hmm. Nothing new in that respect, as I anticipated. But what is new, Greg, in this book that I had not expected is that the first third of this book is devoted to a purely philosophical discussion of anti-realism mm. about the world. Mm-hmm. It is a radically postmodernist view of reality that Hawking and Lodinoff uh, lay out in the first third of this book. And this is so ironic because on the first page of the book, they say philosophy is dead. <laughs> I know. I... These are questions that were traditional philosophically answered, but now we will answer them as scientists. I, I thought... And then they launch into this discussion of this postmodernist uh, anti-realism. It's bizarre. I know. I, I saw that, and it's the first line of the second paragraph, and I thought, uh, what a shot to fire over the bow uh, right at the beginning. And it just struck me, and, and I hope this doesn't sound condescending, but it, it struck me as, the, as, 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 the, as hubris and ignorance for them to make such a statement, especially given what follows in the next couple of chapters, which is a, there's a little bit of history of science in there, um, but and and with philosophers Aristotle and Descartes and uh, um, some of the others, and and I and I just I thought what do, what do they think they're doing here? You know, with this opening salvo and then going into the first three third of the book like this. You know, it, you're absolutely right about the arrogance and condescension that such a statement represents, because they have succeeded in insulting every member of the Department of Philosophy (laughs) at Cambridge University, where Mm. Hawking teaches. And this includes people like Michael Redhead, uh, D.H. Meller, and other very eminent philosophers of science. Mm -hmm. And they're saying these men haven't kept abreast of Mm. the field. And I just wonder, well, what in the world have these men, have Hawking and Lodinoff read that would allow them to make a statement that oh, arrogant, that oh. condescending. Well, you know what it reminds me of, Bill, is it, it makes me think of an eight-year-old who is looking at his parents, and he's saying, I don't need you anymore. I'm going to run away and make it on my own. I, <laughs> yeah. I, I tried that when I was eight years old, by the way, and I know you can't get very far. And by the same token, he's acting like science doesn't need philosophy when, when, when science is a stepchild of philosophy. Yes, and the book itself bears testimony to that fact. They cannot escape Mm -hmm. philosophy in doing this book themselves. And so what they wind up doing is amateurish, Mm -hmm. bad philosophy. Well, was it Einstein who said scientists are poor philosophers? Yeah, it was. Albert Einstein this, made that comment. The man of science is a poor philosopher. Yeah, and the, and and this this book is is an example of this. And we don't mean at all. I mean, it's. And we're starting out this uh, conversation here, kind of gasping at how bad it's. It's the book itself starts out, and uh, we we don't mean to just be hurling epithets to to just diminish right. them and move on. It's because here I'm speaking, friends, with a man of philosophy himself who knows these issues inside and out, and I've got a, a little clue on some of these things. And as as we look at the opening salvos and the opening discussion, we 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 see immediately how woefully inadequate the foundation for this book is right out of the gate before we even get to the quantum mechanics mm, yeah that's right uh but th- that's another issue the quantum mechanics let me just offer a, a question about this because I, I do want to get back to the philosophy in a few minutes because i think there's some serious maybe what might be called external conceptual problems in the way they set this up the quantum mechanics and their scientific determinism but you know yeah. i think that a lot of folks are just intimidated by the quantum mechanics label and it's it's almost like we have our ideas and we thought them through and then somebody kind of says quantum mechanics and all the rest of us have to 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 lay down and surrender you know <laughs> yeah. because oh well quantum mechanics has spoken and i have a feeling that a lot of people are going to read this and say or not even read it just know what stephen hawking's view is and say stephen hawking says it i believe it that settles it because quantum mechanics is king yeah. is, is, i think you're right there is a kind of intimidation factor that the professional scientist can use to silence debate and I think what the layperson needs to understand is that 
Although the mathematical core of quantum physics, that is to say subatomic physics, mm -hmm. the mathematical equations are highly confirmed, well established, but there are at least 10 different physical interpretations of what those equations mean, and nobody knows which of those interpretations is correct. Mm. And Hawking and Lodinoff never mention this fact. They just pick one of those interpretations uh, and run with it, and they never bother to mention the fact that nobody really knows if this is the correct interpretation of these equations. Yeah, well, some of those guys kind of jokingly say that nobody even knows what quantum mechanics itself means. Now, that's got to be an overstatement, but I think it's meant to show how much uh, how much um, uncertainty, shall we say, indeterminism <laughs> there might be with regards to the field itself. Right. What what we need to understand is that the scientific theory is composed of two components. There's the mathematical core. Those are the equations. Mm -hmm. And then there's the physical interpretation of the equations. And it is the mathematics of quantum mechanics that are well established, well confirmed. But the physical interpretation is, as you say, so obscure that someone like Richard Feynman said nobody really understands mm -hmm. quantum physics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and he's somebody, he's a player. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and he's referring there to the physical interpretation. He doesn't mean nobody can do the equations or that it's too right. hard or anything, but that we don't really understand what the correct physical interpretation of these uh, is. Bill, could you cash that out for us, our listeners a little bit? I mean, I think that some of them are thinking, well, okay, what's what's the difference between an equation that seems reliable and a physical interpretation of the equation? Right. Well, um, let me just give an example of this. Um, in quantum mechanics, there is uh, an element of indeterminacy, that is to say, unpredictability. And one of the major interpretive disputes is, does this mean that reality itself mm -hmm. is indeterminate? That reality itself behaves in non-deterministic ways. Random ways. Or, kind of. Yeah, randomly, if you will, within certain probability bounds, but nevertheless, it's, it's not determined. Or does this reflect simply an uncertainty in our knowledge of the way the world is? Mm -hmm. And those are two radically different interpretations. On the one hand, it would say that reality itself is somehow indeterminate. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it would say, no, no, reality is fully determinate, but we can never know reality with certainty with respect to certain of these properties, like the exact speed and position of an uh, subject. Sure, that's particle. Heisenberg. You know, I've always been troubled by this. this. By the way, this issue came up last hour with a caller and uh, determinism and, and whether we're talking about uh, um, epistemic indeterminism, right. your point, that you can't know it, as opposed to more ontic, that the thing yeah. is, is random in itself. And it strikes me that, uh, and this was the, con and I don't know what you, th I'd, be, I'd be interested to hear what you had to say about this, Bill, but I, my, my th understanding of Heisenberg, who the uncertainty principle there is if you, you measure one thing and it affects the other thing, and so you can only measure one at a time, but you can't get both measurements accurate at the time, that this was clearly a epistemological, that is just a difficulty in knowing at, a, at any given point in time these details, but it didn't mean that the, the things themselves were not determinate, that they weren't following a certain pattern because of the nature of things. And it seems to me that people have taken this epistemic notion or difficulty and they've blown it into a huge, uh, you know, metaphysical principle that nothing can be known and we create reality when we measure it and, and these kinds of things. Is that well, a that, misstep? Yeah. Well, what, what, what you've actually described, there's about three different of, the, uh, of these physical interpretations that I was referring mm. to. One physical interpretation would be that indeterminacy is ontic. Mm -hmm. Another one would be, no, reality is deterministic, but the indeterminacy is epistemic. A third interpretation would be this observer created reality, that by our observations we actually create the way the world is. And as I say, these are all empirically equivalent. You can't decide mm -hmm. among those three based on scientific 
consideration. In other words, the uh, evidence... I'll make the same predictions. Yeah, the, the evidence, when you say empirically equivalent, the evidence is the evidence that we have equally supports each explanation. Yeah, they're all equally consistent. They all make the same predictions. Mm -hmm. um, and so, at least to date, you can't decide empirically which of these physical interpretations is correct. Okay, so on the one hand, when we hear uh, the 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 quantum mechanics kind of uh, uh, salvo fired against, uh, say, say theists of some sort, that um, we, we ought not be intimidated by that because oftentimes people are misusing the quantum mechanics as if there was a, an established, accepted way of understanding this that there's no debate about and that we've moved forward in our understanding about the nature of the yeah. universe as a result of quantum mechanics. Yeah, that, that's right, Greg. And any elementary book, a popular level book that would introduce you to the quantum world or the quantum realm, we'll talk about these different physical interpretations. Mm -hmm. And we'll say in the end uh, that nobody really knows which one of these, if any, is correct. And so when people base grand philosophical or theological conclusions on these interpretations, it's very easy to simply respond, well, you know, there are at least nine other ways of looking at this, mm -hmm. and there's no reason to think that your view is the correct one. Do, do you think Stephen Hawking is actually trading on a particular understanding of how quantum mechanics cashes itself out in order to make his case uh, for the, the universe self-creating? And we'll get into some detail about what he means by that. But do you think I that... I don't think that his use of quantum mechanics and a particular interpretation of that is so critical in the origin of the universe, frankly. Mm -hmm. I think it comes into play more when he wants to get rid of the fine-tuning or okay, explain yeah. away the fine-tuning by generating many worlds. Mm -hmm. And one of the interpretations, or actually there are a few, of quantum mechanics would be a many-worlds interpretation. I see. And he appeals to a particular many-worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics to generate a plurality of universes. Right and thereby to multiply your probabilistic right. uh, resources for getting our finely tuned universe by chance. Yeah, well, well, we'll talk about that a little bit later in the hour because that is a, there are two main arguments that have played a, a role in defending theism recently, the, the cosmological argument, which you have been so uh, such an important contributor to, uh, which Hawking takes exception with, and then the teleological argument, design argument, we hear about the Discovery Institute, and Hawking has a different strategy for going after that. That. Um, I, I, we'll get to that shortly, I, I, those two things, but I, I want to go to the philosophy for just a moment that he presents in the beginning of the book, and I, I wonder if you could speak to this. He says, this is Stephen Hawking, says that he uh, is a scientific determinist. That's the principle that, that is that scientific laws determine everything in the future and every ha, everything that happened in the past. And he applies, and I don't know why he adds scientific to determinism, because it seems to me like determinism is just determinism, you know. Um, but uh, he, he, uh, he applies this to human nature, too. So, yeah. so there is there is only one kind of causation in his view, and that's event causation. There is no agency, certainly not of God, but no, not of human beings as well. Uh, and what, what stuns me is that on this view, then, if physics is everything, then physics would have to have to determine the order of the words in his own book. That's right. And not the laws of discursive reasoning and inference and logic and, and yeah. the kind of thing. So what does that make of his entire argument? If he That's what I wondered as I read this passage in the book. I thought, what confidence can they have that anything they have written in this book is true? since on their view they were just determined to write it. Mm -hmm. It's like water gushing from a pipe <laughs> or a branch growing out of a tree. It, 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 they were just determined to write these mm -hmm. things. So it, what confidence can they have that what they say is true? And in particular, what confidence can they have that their affirmation of determinism is true. Right, right. It undercuts itself. Yeah, I, you know, and 
uh, as I read, I've just read uh, up to the bullfish, the goldfish bowl. Yeah, yeah uh, that's chapter. anti realism again. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get to that too. But I uh, just as he lays down his foundation and and then his assertion of scientific determinism, I did not get the sense that he has the slightest inkling of the difficulty that he has with the views he's just laid, uh, and 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 the hole that he's digging for himself. I'm sure you're right about that. I think it's very naive philosophically. But here's a further question I had, Greg. How do you square his affirmation of scientific determinism, which he associates, you may remember, with Laplace? Yes, that's right. Um, so this is Laplacian determinism that goes back to Newtonian physics. Mm. How do you reconcile the affirmation of that kind of determinism with his view of quantum mechanics, which is indeterministic? Mm. Mm -hmm. This, to me, is a major contradiction that I frankly don't understand. Mm -hmm. And you can't try to escape it by saying that quantum indeterminacy only operates on the subatomic level, because it's easy to amplify those subatomic effects to have macroscopic results. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I heard an amusing illustration of this. Imagine a, a student who's working in the laboratory one night on, a, on an experiment, and he's delayed in leaving the lab because of the decay of a radioactive isotope that he's working with. Well, that's a quantum indeterminate process. Uh -huh. So he's delayed leaving the laboratory because it takes extra time to decay. As he leaves the laboratory, he runs into a girl in the hall whom he meets and eventually falls in love with and then marries. And so this quantum indeterminate event oh, yeah. has major macroscopic <laughs> yeah. results in the world. And, and, good... it, it, and the fact is you can't affirm mm -hmm. scientific determinism if you're all going, also going to hold that quantum indeterminacy is ontic rather than just epistemic. Right. And, and of course, the difficulty, if you don't affirm uh, at least uh, the determinacy of event causation, in, the, in other words, the natural realm and the... And the if you don't affirm that, then it seems to me you can't have science work to begin with because this little thing of experimental repeatability and all the things that are bound up with that requires that events follow themselves deterministically, uh, at least apart from any agency intervening, and that's why science can do the work it can do. Yeah, that's, that's true, at least on the macroscopic level. Mm -hmm. Now, as I say, on the quantum level, because of this uncertainty principle, what you can predict are results within certain bounds. Mm -hmm. And you get a kind of bell curve, you yeah. know what I mean, of right, where it's right. most probable that your result will be found. But there, there is a, a definite indeterminacy on the quantum level that... Uh, needs to be recognized, whether it's epistemic or ontic, that's right. a matter of interpretation. Okay, fair enough. We're talking with William Lane Craig. Uh, he uh, is giving us a, a little tutorial here to understand Stephen Hawking's new book, The Grand Design. Um, Bill, back to this book here, I have a question that I'd like, I'd, I'm interested in your response to, and it's a question that I would ask Stephen Hawking and others that talk about, that are materialists who talk about the laws of nature the way that Hawking talks about them, and he's he seems to be talking about them variably as deterministic kinds of things and other times as indeterministic kinds of things. But my question would be, are the laws of nature, these laws that you're talking about, Professor Hawking, are these merely descriptive or are they prescriptive? In other words, are the laws just summaries of the way things happen to be have behaved in the past, or do the laws somehow actually govern things? Yeah, this is an interesting question, and he actually talks a little bit about what a law of nature is, but he, he quotes a philosopher, John Carroll, and says this question is a lot more subtle than it at first mm -hmm. appears. Yeah, of course, those uh, philosophers really, are dead now, right? The philosophy's dead, right? Yeah, right. He doesn't need them. They never really answer the question, but the working definition he seems to have is that he thinks of a law of nature as a rule mm -hmm. that allows you to predict how things will happen apart from the observed behavior of a system. Mm -hmm. So I take it that he does think that these laws of nature have some kind of a prescriptive force, mm -hmm. that they're not just descriptive, that they, they do have a sort of necessity about them that allows you to say, well, if...
if the system were in such and such a state, mm -hmm. this is what would happen. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it seems to me that this raises a problem for them, him then, because as a materialist, uh, wh what is the nature of these occult forces, these hidden powers that are lurking out uh, it, uh, somewhere? I don't know <laughs> if they're in the material universe or not, but if they're if they are laws that that cause things to happen what is the nature of those laws and how do, how does he square that with a materialistic account of the universe and indeed what what gives these law what grounds the force of these laws to begin with yeah i couldn't answer that for him because i don't think they address that question mm -hmm. as i say the the extent to which he discusses this is to say Here's what a law of nature is often thought to be. Mm -hmm. However, it's a lot more subtle and more difficult than this. And he gives a couple of counterexamples, and then he just moves on. Mm -hmm. now, but and it's left unresolved. Would, would, from where you sit, would that create a problem for him to say that these are prescriptive forces? I mean, from a materialistic perspective, does that strike you as being inconsistent and, and also something that requires a grounding outside of the materialistic universe? Well, I, I don't think that we have to think of the laws of nature being prescriptive as being um, forces. It seems to me that what he could say would be that there are certain substances in the world that have certain essential properties, mm -hmm. and that that determines their behavior, and the laws of nature have the sort of necessity they do because of the property. I see. So he's going to ground it in their properties. Have. Okay. Okay. Well, that, well, that, that makes sense, at least as far as it goes. Um, he, um, he, although he has this deterministic uh, view that he talks about in there, a sci scientific determinism, yes. and um, he seems to think, and I know he's on Larry King the other night, and he made it uh, fairly clear that his project is to show that because of scientific determinism, there is no need for God at all. So this is another declaration that God is now dead, no need. The law, physics is everything, yeah. I think, is well, his comment. Think, let, let's, be, let's be generous here, or, or sympathetic to our, our interlocutor that we're hawking. Okay. What he says is that God isn't necessary to explain the way the universe is. Mm -hmm. Now, that wouldn't exclude, Greg, having, a say, a moral argument for God's existence, mm -hmm. or maybe an ontological argument for God's existence. I could imagine someone who would defend God on other grounds, but I, I doubt that Hawking is very open to those. No. Here, but uh, at least his argument doesn't exclude that. It, the argument is limited to saying that you don't need God to explain the origin and the nature of the universe. Yeah, well, I, I think you've identified a limitation of what he's able to do with his particular argument. But, but yeah. I take it that people like Hawking and, and uh, Richard Dawkins, for example, they seem to be able, they make their argument, Dawkins in the area of Darwinian evolution, and they think if, that this particular explanation succeeds in their area, that this somehow becomes a more aggressive argument that God doesn't exist at all. Well, I think that's certainly the case with Dawkins. In the God delusion, he concludes, therefore, God almost mm -hmm. certainly does not exist. Mm -hmm. But I don't find Hawking and Mladenov making that mistake, at least. Mm -hmm. they, they seem to be much more tentative and just say, God isn't necessary to create the universe or explain the fine-tuning. And that's why I said it's not really any different conclusion than what was in A Brief History of Time. Mm -hmm where he just says, what place then for a creator? But that would be consistent with, say, a moral argument for God's existence, yeah. though then that would be hard to square with his determinism. Right. There's How can no... you have significant <laughs> moral choices and moral agents if we're determined in everything we do? Right. So not only is rationality lost in determinism, uh -huh. morality is lost. I thought it was kind of uh -huh. ironic that according to one reporter, uh, and it, it, uh, I think a colleague of yours that, uh, that we, we got received the email of his assessment of the Larry King show, that Deepak Chopra, of all people, was the one who offered the most trenchant uh, criticism of Stephen Hawking. That was, that was a bizarre interview. I thought that was kind of ironic. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I think that Hawking, I would love to know what he thinks about morality. I mean, we know what Dawkins thinks. Dawkins thinks it's all illusory. 
that there is no good, there is no evil. As he says, there's nothing but pitiless indifference. Mm -hmm. I wonder what Stephen Hawking thinks mm -hmm. about moral values mm -hmm. and duties and things of that sort. Well, he does make some reflections in there. He talks about why the universe is such a mess, or the or the the human civilization is such a mess. So there's some hidden moral judgments that are in there. Uh, let me move to the cosmological argument because it, it seems to me this book is meant to take a shot at the legitimacy of the cosmological argument. And, and you've done a lot of work there, uh, and you can characterize it your way. I I have a simple characterization of the cosmological argument: a big bang needs a big banger. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's a simple way of putting it, but the yeah. idea is that that um, that uh, given that the universe began to exist, it had to have a cause. This is your Kalam characterization, and um, and something doesn't come from nothing is the presumption there. Uh, an event uh, doesn't uh, like the beginning of the universe is not uncaused. So so how is what is Hawking's strategy to circumnavigate here the implications of the Kalam or any other cosmological argument for that it's matter? Very very interesting to read his exposition in this book about that because it's a little bit different than brief history of time he explains this model that he developed with james hartle at ucsb out there in california that uses imaginary time for the initial uh, segment of the universe and this has the effect of sort of rounding off the beginning of the universe so that it's not like a cone that goes back to a point, a beginning point, but it's more like a badminton birdie that has a sort of rounded off southern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. And in this book, he is willing to talk about the south pole of that so southern hemisphere mm -hmm. as being the beginning of the universe, that this is where the universe originated and that this is the first point in time it's just not a singularity that's mm -hmm. all but he is willing to call it the beginning of the universe and so there's nothing in his model that is inconsistent with the universe having an absolute beginning mm -hmm. and in fact he affirms it and there's nothing in the model that explains why that south pole point came into being mm -hmm. rather than just nothing so when you read that section of the book, it leaves you still wondering, well, but, but why did this imaginary time regime come into existence? And they return to that question in the final chapter of the book, where he says that if the positive energy of the universe and the negative energy balance each other out, then the net value of the energy of the universe is zero, and therefore the universe can come into existence just out of empty space by a fluctuation of the energy that is in empty space. Mm -hmm. But you see, the problem with that as an explanation, Greg, is that empty space isn't nothing. Mm -hmm. He's talking there about the vacuum energy that fills empty space and says things can fluctuate out of this energy into material existence. And that empty space doesn't exist until the South Pole on his model is real, comes to exist. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, he hasn't said anything to explain why something exists rather than nothing. Mm -hmm. All he's done is explain that if you have an empty space filled with vacuum energy, that energy can fluctuate into a material mm -hmm. form. Mm -hmm. And that's all he's done. So he hasn't, in a sense, he hasn't gone back far enough to the ultimate beginning, although something like an ultimate beginning from nothing for even that vacuum space is intimated by his model. Required by it. That, that vacuum space doesn't exist prior to the South Pole on mm -hmm. his, his model. Mm -hmm. So in one sense, Greg, this is really a great help to the person who wants to argue for the cosmological argument because... It affirms an absolute beginning of the universe before which nothing mm -hmm. existed. He says mm -hmm. there is nothing prior to that South Pole point. He said it's a meaningless question to ask what there was before because it's the beginning of time and space. And he doesn't say anything about how this could come into being uncaused from nothing. Mm -hmm. All he talks about later is how when you have empty space, filled with vacuum energy, the energy can fluctuate into a material form. And, and so, really, 
it just it doesn't even address mm. the fundamental issue mm. raised by the Cosmos. So when he, he says, um, and I saw the quotations in different places, and maybe on the interview, that the, that the, that the universe uh, sp- is sp- comes into existence spontaneously out of nothing, the key word there is nothing, yeah. because nothing doesn't mean nothing. What he's talking about there, you see, is the quantum vacuum. Mm-hmm. He's, it, when he says the universe fluctuates into existence, or comes into existence from nothing because of quantum gravity, there he's talking, and he's very clear about this in the book, it's in the last chapter, mm-hmm. he's talking about empty space, which is filled with this vacuum energy. Mm-hmm and is constant throughout the vacuum. And if the positive energy and the negative energy of the universe balance each other out, he says, then this, it could be a fluctuation of this energy in empty space. And what you have to understand, as I say, is that empty space doesn't exist before that south pole of the universe exists. So it, so, it, it, it kind of reminds me of the, the, the joke that uh, where... <laughs> Where the man was going to create, uh, oh yeah, uh, and they, you know, he's going to have this bet with God, and he says, first you take dirt, and you create life, and God says, you got to get your own dirt, yeah. uh, and so yeah, and you got to get your own space time. Exactly, exactly, and so he's already starting with God's dirt, if you will, uh, to move further, to move further on in his uh, d- description of the the yeah. subsequent creation of the universe, and that's yeah, and and as I say, Greg, a careful reading of the book makes this very clear I, I i'm not trying to read something in here it's it's explicit and so it really i think shows that the claims that are in the newspapers that they put out to pump the book you know to market it they're just nothing but hype mm-hmm. Hmm. I, I really look at this book read carefully as being quite confirmatory of the cosmological mm, argument. Very interesting. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit about the many worlds hypothesis. This comes up too, and it's 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 as far as I understand the chief uh, rejoinder to the design argument for the existence of God. We're talking with William Lane Craig. Back in just a moment on Stand to Reason. Greg Koko back with you here in our final segment with Dr. William Lane Craig on Stand to Reason, talking about Stephen Hawking's book, The Grand Design. Um, Bill, how is this book being uh, received, uh, just generally speaking, among his contemporaries and colleagues? Um, you mentioned something about the affront uh, that his opening was to the philosophers of even of Cambridge and everywhere, really. Philosophy is dead. And then also to, to others in, in the area of math and physics. Well, I've been very pleased, Greg, by the reviews that I've read by people like Roger Penrose or uh, a physicist in, I believe it was in The Economist. People are not being fooled Mm -hmm. by the book, Uh, at least professional scientists and philosophers are not. Mm -hmm. And they are making these very same critical comments that you and I have been making this evening. So uh, if you look at the reviews that are out there by professional colleagues right. of the book. They have been very uh, critical. Right. Well, Roger Penrose was one of his colleagues that worked with him on the, the standard Big Bang project, mm-hmm. I think, back in the 70s, the paper they wrote, and working with Einstein's general relativity, and uh, bring me up to date on that. Right. He developed the singularity theorems that proved that the Big Bang went back to a singularity, and mm-hmm. these are called the Hawking-Penrose singularity mm-hmm. theorem. So Penrose is a man of every equal the scientific stature of Stephen Hawking. An able critic. And uh, he, the thing that Penrose spots and protests in his review is precisely this wild anti-realism mm-hmm. of Hawking and Mladenov uh, expl- that we spoke of near the beginning of our interview. Yes, why don't you take a moment and explain what that is for a lot of folks may not yeah. uh, be tracking with that okay. concept. What, what they hold is that there is no objective reality out there independent of our models of reality and what a a model is for them is a sort of way of organizing your sense perceptions that come into your brain through your five senses and you organize these in some way and they will say that there is no reality Mm. about the way the world actually is it's just these different ways of modeling it. These useful fictions, kind of. Yeah, that's right. All you can say is that one model is more convenient than another, but it is not more correct or more accurate because 
And it's not that we don't know the way reality is, Greg. On their view, there is no objective reality Mm. independent of these models. Mm. So they actually say, get this, at one point in the book, that there is no objective fact of the matter whether the young earth creationist is right or the big bang cosmologist is right young earth creationism and big bang cosmology are equally valid models of reality and it's meaningless to say which one describes the way the world really is because it's just model dependent and all we can say is that the big bang is a more convenient model well, than now, young well, earth creationism it just it just seems to me that this is is like one contradiction after another oh, because this, this is just another way that his whole thesis is undermined because what are we to make of his scientific determinism which is the view that he doesn't argue for but simply assumes and he yeah. bases the the larger part of his book on this notion uh, what do we are we to take that as a as a real or accurate depiction of the way the, the world actually is? No, I guess not. In no, light it's of- just his model, and someone who has a model of the world that includes free agents is just as, you know, valid as his view. Oh, man. Was there some... I thought I heard somebody say that right towards the end of his book, he affirmed free will, uh, contrary to what he said at the beginning of the work, book. Are you familiar with this? No, I did not catch that anywhere in the book. Mm. Now, I could have missed it, mm. but... I didn't. I didn't see that anywhere. Let's talk about the many worlds hypothesis. Mm-hmm. We just got about six or seven more minutes here, and okay. I know it's not much time to cover this. But maybe you could explain how this hypothesis is meant to be a rejoinder to the claim that the universe looks designed, mm-hmm. fine-tuned, because it actually was designed or fine-tuned. What but, the uh, many worlds theorist wants to say is that the fine-tuning of the universe is just an accident due to chance. It is pure chance. Now, if you had to roll the roulette wheel and predict what number it would come up on, you would have very, very small chance of being right. But if you had a thousand or ten thousand roulette wheels all spinning simultaneously, Mm -hmm. then the chances are good that your number will come up on one of them at least. Mm -hmm. And so the idea here is by having all of these invisible parallel universes out there, by chance alone, if they're randomly ordered, and that's a big if, Mm -hmm. then in one of them at least you'll have fine-tuning, and the observers in that world will look out at their universe and marvel at how well-designed mm-hmm. it is, not realizing that there are all these other universes unknown to them in which the uh, constants and quantities of nature mm-hmm. are incompatible with, with life. Now, what strikes me interesting about this response is that um, it is a vigorous response, I think, in, uh, and meant to be a vigorous challenge against the, the fine-tuning argument because, partly, I think, because the fine-tuning argument seems so compelling to so many people. Yeah, and they don't deny fine-tuning. Again, this is one of the positive aspects of this book that is helpful to the the, the theist, is they they characterize fine-tuning as being almost miraculous in their words. Describe what what you mean by fine-tuning here for people who might not be familiar with that. What I mean is that that the initial conditions of the universe, given in the Big Bang, are so finely uh, calibrated Mm. for intelligent life that if they were altered by just the tiniest bit, the less than a hair's breadth, life would be impossible. Mm -hmm. So the universe looks like it's been exquisitely designed to produce intelligent life. And Hawking and Molodinov don't dispute that. They say, yes, it it looks that way. There's an apparently miraculous fine-tuning, but they will use all of these many other worlds to explain it away, just like having many roulette wheels turning at the same okay, time. Okay, now here's the question that I have. Of the, uh, we see how the explanation is meant to work, but there are some assumptions that are built into these explanations that need to be accurate in order for this to be a, um, a, a valid re- rebuttal to the fine-tuning argument. What are some of those assumptions? Well, one assumption would be um, that there even are these other universes, that there are <laughs> other worlds. Pardon me for because, chuckling, but that's, that yeah, would be an I mean, important that's detail, the, that's I think. The main point. If this is going to be a scientific hypothesis, as opposed to a metaphysical mm-hmm. speculation, then they need to specify what is the physical mechanism that generates these many worlds. 
And there are lots of different suggestions, and Hawking's chosen mechanism is what's called uh, the sum over histories. And if I could just try to explain this very briefly, when a subatomic particle goes from point A to point B, you can't predict exactly the path it follows. So physicists say, well, let's assume it follows all possible paths, and then we'll take an average of them to find which path it most probably followed. Well, what Hawking does is he interprets all of those paths to be equally real mm -hmm. and to be each one in a different universe. So he takes what is just a mathematical calculating trick and invests it with metaphysical reality mm -hmm. to get his many worlds. And, and that's just a wild uh, use of this sum over histories mathematical trick that it was never intended to be a piece of metaphysics. So would it, would it be fair to say that it looks suspiciously like um, he is he's kind of manufacturing the th these multiple universes because it, it, it solves this problem for him? It allows him to get out from underneath the, the, uh, the impact of the fine-tuning argument? They deny that, Greg, but I, I think know that they that's do. quite true. I think that's true because Feynman's sum over histories is just a mathematical calculating device. These aren't real, these other universes or other paths, and it's only by investing them with reality that he can try to get his many worlds yeah, and, to and avoid what I, I thank you, Bill. I want people to see that, that there is a lot of kind of bald-faced asserting that seems to be going on here, yeah. but because it's done by this man with, with, with his credentials and because there's a lot of quantum language Quantum uh, mechanics language it, it, it ha lends it's almost blinding with science and lends credibility to these bare assertions and like the bare assertion that there is there are no violations to the laws of nature. He never proves that. He never nope. shows that. He just says it. Yeah, and, and other scientists aren't fooled. Yeah, well, that's great. good. And so, so uh, what are some of the other assumptions that uh, have to be in place? In, uh, you mentioned that they have to be random universes too, not just that they exist. Yeah, but they, have they, to be random. they have to be randomly ordered. And you have to say there's a sufficient number of them, preferably infinite, in mm. order to guarantee that the finely tuned universe will appear somewhere. Mm -hmm. And none of those assumptions are proven either. They're just all adopted ad hoc. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, it's, it's, it's good to hear these things because these are some of the things that I saw when I was reading uh, in, in this material. But even for myself, you know, there is a... It gives one pause when you see a person of Stephen Hawking's stature <laughs> that sure. um, that that makes these pronouncements, and, and then then I see something I think is amiss. And I think, gee, well, maybe I'm the one who's making the mistake and not him. But these seem to be uh, significant drawbacks of his approach, his presumptions, his assumptions, his methodology, his conclusions. All of these things are in question. Yeah, I think anybody who has mastered the arguments that I lay out in reasonable faith will already be equipped to answer these objections raised in this book mm -hmm. because there isn't anything new that I haven't already discussed mm -hmm. there. Um, I think you mentioned there, too, or maybe I'm thinking of your blog, that even if there are multiple universes, you still need, you're back to the cosmological problem, you still need a cause for those universes, right? Yeah, that's right. We've not solved the origin problem of where did that South Pole, you know, in his model come from. Mm -hmm. And moreover, Roger Penrose has raised very significant criticisms of the many worlds hypothesis as an explanation of the fine tuning and he doesn't even interact with the criticisms of mm -hmm. his erstwhile colleague Roger Penrose which I take to be just deliberate blindness you, you can't just ignore the public published mm -hmm. critiques of many worlds by a man like Roger Penrose mm -hmm. as they do in this book mm -hmm. so would you say um what would you say as an assessment of the of of uh, an overall assessment, a generalization of uh, Stephen Hawking's uh, attempted critique or response to the cosmological argument and the fine-tuning argument, the teleological argument? I think his work on the cosmological argument is a positive asset hmm. to the soundness of the argument. I think it's very helpful, and it reinforces uh, the second premise that the universe began to exist. So I, I look at it as very helpful. I'm uh -huh. going to be quoting this book. Uh, <laughs> on, the, on the second one, on the fine-tuning, I think there we have to say that it's based upon 
um, wild metaphysical speculations uh, that are not science at all, but are tendentious interpretations of mathematical uh, models.